Hey everybody, this is Matthew Krause and you are listening to the podcast Working Drummer. Today is my interview with Chuck Tilly. Chuck has worked with many different artists, including the great Felix Cavallari from The Young Rascals, Richard Marks, Lee Greenwood, and most recently, the country supergroup Alabama as of five years ago. Chuck's own band, Six Wire, competed in the reality show called The Next Great American Rock Band back in 2007. This was a proving ground for Chuck and his bandmates and turned into many unique opportunities ever since for them to work in television, either behind the scenes or on screen. Other TV shows that Chuck has worked with include Nashville Star, Can You Duet? He's also a regular actor on the show Nashville, where he plays a drummer. He's also done many live shows where he's been in the house band. As always, you can go to workingdrummer.net where you can find out more about this podcast, see pictures, and find out more about other podcasts that we've done. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter at working underscore drummer, and Instagram as well. Go to iTunes, you can subscribe to the podcast where a new episode of this podcast will be sent to your smart device every week. So let's get to it. Here is Chuck Tilly. I saw you play in uh, Copper Mountain, Colorado. Oh, wow. That was with Felix. Yeah, yeah. with Felix. Um, oh, that was so much fun. That was the first date with that band. I had put that band together to do a Japan tour with him. Oh, wow. And we did that date and went on to Japan after that. That was the first show. We were still working out vocal parts at, at 15 minutes before we went on. Yeah. Vocal stacks of who was singing what part, and <laughs> because it, we didn't get to rehearse that much with him. But I'm trying to think that's of so when funny. that was. Song. That was uh, five years ago. Was it five? September of, of, of 10, because that was the first. I had been working with Felix prior to that, feel, feeling in, and this is a whole other funny story, but I had been working with Felix. Uh, just filling in myself, and then Felix is like, "Man, I need a whole. I need. I need a band to go to Japan because my regular band can't go. None of them can go. It's just th- three piece, and, and oh, okay. everybody's singing. It's, it's this great band, veteran guys. I've been with him forever, and, and Vin- Vinny Santoro being the drummer sing- singer. Saw him this year, actually. At, yeah, and his, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, he couldn't do this tour, and so Felix is like, "I need a whole band," and Steve Cropper. And David Z, you know, David Z, is, you know, was Prince's producer who produced all the the big like Purple Rain and all that stuff. He was the engineer producer on that. David Z used to come see my rock trio all the time. Is this Six Wire? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's three of us within Six Wire called those Small Time Rock Stars, and he used to come. We used to play the Tin Roof, Demumbrian, um, just for fun on Wednesday nights. And it was all 80s and 90s and current covers. We did, we did it just for fun, and it just took off, and we did it for years. And then we started making stupid money <laughs> yeah. on a weeknight, you know, yeah. making great money. So we're like, hell, let's just Sleeping keep Sleeping in doing. your own bed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and we just did it for fun. Anyway, David used to come out all the time and see us. We got to know David. David called Felix and recommended and said, here's your band. I have your band. You, you just got to trust me. Felix didn't know me from anybody. And David... Arranged it. I met Felix, and we were supposed to have a little lunch meeting. And Felix was like, man, you, you know, you come heavily recommended. And Felix is like the nicest, sweetest guy. We we're supposed to have a little short lunch meeting at Starbucks down in Franklin for a minute, and then um, just you know, because uh, we were going to set up maybe just some rehearsals, and he just wanted to hear hear us play as a unit with him and just see how it worked out, you know. Yeah. Anyway, we sat there for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> me, me being total fangirl and and, yeah. and 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 interviewing Felix and you know, like tell me about Atlantic Records in the '60s, you know, and oh, yeah. you know because they were the Rascals yeah. were were the Rascals were at their height and they were they were in the, the that main building in in New York where everybody recorded, you know, uh, Aretha and 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 Otis Redding and all these people would be in the same hallways and they're in the same hallway in the studio recording and stuff and he's and felix has a funniest story of otis redding was a label mate and and had never met him yeah. and he heard they were rehearsing otis poked his head in to see who it was or to see him because he knew it was the young rascals they had just came out with their first single and he pokes his, and felix tells the story he's hilarious but he's like 
I thought you was a black guy, is what Otis said to Felix, because Felix is so soulful and got this gravelly, yeah. this incredible voice. Yeah. And, and it's the funniest thing having Felix tell the story. But anyway, I sat there and just interviewed Felix for two hours, and he told me all these incredible stories. And then we hit it off, and we went and, and we had rehearsals. He liked the band, and next thing you know, we, we started doing that tour with him. And, and, you know, he hired us as a unit, as a, a trio. Yeah. And this was three of us from Six Wire, me and Steve Mandel, a guitar player, and John Howard. Okay. But anyway, that's my Felix story. But I didn't realize you've seen us at Copper Mountain. Yeah, that was a that was a great. Steve Eby was playing there with the yeah, uh, with Bill the Lloyd. And, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Um, and was, John Waite. That's right. That's right. Because um, Steve, that was one of those things, and I might have told this story where Steve asked if I could play this gig. On, you know, I said, "Man, I'm I'm out of town." He goes, "Oh yeah, where are you going?" I said, "I'm going to Colorado." He goes, "Where?" Uh, Copper Mountain. He goes, "That's where. That's why I need a sub because I'm going too." Oh, I was that's going funny. there with, with Savannah Jack, this other band. All oh, right. And uh, yeah, I know him. That's uh, yeah, uh, uh, Don Gatlin, yeah. Don Ellis. Right. Yeah, Don. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Daryl so, and Don. Right. Yeah. Well, so um, that's right. Yeah. And so we. Uh, he goes. Well, listen. If you're going, you want to play percussion, and you know we're doing. What record oh, did my. they do? They do. Um, they did Rubber Soul, I think. Maybe it wasn't. It was one of the. I can't remember what, what record. I it can't was. remember. I was there. We watched the whole show, and I'm blanking. Yeah. It might have been a Beatles thing. Yeah, it was. It was. I remember it was Beatles. You know, but but just to be able to. You know, he's a. I need you to shake tambourine and, and maracas and do all those parts. And oh it yeah, was the funnest thing. And and I guess you could go back to uh, Steve's uh, interview. If anybody's listening to this, you can hear that story because Steve's one of the interviews that I have done. And, and right, we yeah, talk about that here. story and how fun it was not to have to play the role of the drum set player. You know, right to have tempos and count-ins and all those responsibilities, but just to kind of like shed that responsibility in lieu of. <laughs> Shaking tambourines and doing all those cool Beatles songs, you know. Yeah. So fun. That's neat. No, I saw you there. That was that was great. I mean, I've seen you several times. I, I remember, oh, wow. um, I think more recently, um, or maybe it was, um, maybe it was, a, you were with one of, one of the many house bands that you were playing with. And yeah, uh, there was a slew of artists that were part of the TV show. It wasn't Nashville. Right. It might have been Can You Duet or something. Oh, yeah, it might have been that. Or CMT Next Superstar. That, or... I bet that was it. And it was one of those gigs at the stage where I was at last night. Oh. We were, and uh, yeah. you guys were there, and there was just, uh, I think, where I was getting ready to play. or It was either Can You Duet or Next Superstar, because we filmed an episode there. I remember that. Yeah. Because we could barely fit in there, all the all the camera equipment and lighting, and the audio, and uh, we had to just jam everything in there. And oh yeah, put the crowd in there too, you know. And we had trucks lining down the street, yeah. and I mean, yeah, that was, yeah, that was either next superstar or can you do that? I, I, yeah, I'll never forget that because I, I couldn't believe we got all those people in there and the crew and all the the camera yeah. <laughs> equipment. And, yeah. And we, they wanted to get a jib in there for the uh, the big shots. I, I can't remember if they got one in there or not. They were just... There'd be no room for the people. I, I know, yeah. <laughs> I remember they had me... You know, that stage, I was pushed back and my elbows were hitting the wall because they had all the gear crammed up on and back oh, toward the drum riser. Yeah. And, and the, the bass player's right arm was like hitting my hi-hat. And, I mean, it was... Here, hold the stick, just in case. <laughs> you, play, you play the left side of the kit for me. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just an example of so many of the kind of quote-unquote house bands that it seems like you're involved with. And Man, it's, there seems to be mm. a, a, a television component to a lot of these gigs. Yeah, uh, I don't know if all of them, but um, you're talking about a production that has a lot more to do than just audio and all this stuff. So mm -hmm. could you maybe expound upon that, uh, how that works, what your role is maybe? Wow. Um, what, what a typical day is well, um, like every show is different, and, and I've been lucky enough um, to have done a lot of um, different series and, and have been in the house band. And uh, the first, <clears throat> um, I guess, most well-known one was Nashville Star. Mm -hmm. I was the drummer 
on that show for three seasons, um, starting in season three, four, and five, and um, and that's live. That's live, live. That's not taped. People didn't realize that it was no, not even a tape delay. I mean, it was live, live. So, so what's typical on so, a tape delay? Is there like a thirty second? Second, or, well, maybe maybe seven seconds. Okay, or or it could be longer than that. Yeah. But this was in real time, live because it yeah. was a satellite feed, okay. and we were down to the second. Yeah. And so the drummer on a show like that, and that's how award shows are done too. They're 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 in real time, you know, live. Okay. Um, I was thinking they had some sort of delay just for in case somebody dropped Maybe there might have been a something. small one, but... Uh, well, I mean, I thought that was maybe the reason why they started that was somebody, you know, just in case hey, somebody said, well, hey, what the fuck is going on? And they're like, hey, oh, we got to have that. We got to we gotta blank that out. So I don't know if that was the reason. And that's why my, my mic isn't live right there. <laughs> Well, that's the reason my, why my I talk pod- back mic. That's the reason why I do podcasting and not live. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, a typical day, well, like say Nashville Star was, and this is the way a lot of them work. Was um, you have rehearsal days, <clears throat> and, and those contestants are working up a lot of material. I mean, this is the way Idol works and The Voice. They're working up a lot of material because they have that that show and then maybe the show the right the day after if they make the cut mm. so they have to have one or two songs prepared and ready to go and, right. and in the meantime the the production company is scrambling to get clearance on that song because they they only get a song choice a day or two beforehand if that wow. so everybody's scrambling to, okay we gotta get clearance you better have one or two songs ready because if you're gonna do this elton john song what if you didn't get clearance then you maybe you, you should have a paul mccartney song in your back pocket just in case yeah. you know and that happened there were issues where we would even work up we would in good faith rehearse some songs at the last minute the network go oh we didn't get clearance for that you know so and so didn't want us playing this song We're like what so we yeah. would can a song we've already rehearsed and yeah come up with plan B but a typical day on that show would be um, we'd have production rehearsal day we would, we would do just music rehearsals a day or two before broadcast and go to SIR and just do music nothing but music and each contestant would get like 30 minutes we'd come in and work up their song and, and we would come up with the arrangements because you're on TV time so each song can only be a minute 10 a minute 20 no more than a minute it was it was you get different song links so yeah. our uh, what they really leaned on us in musical content was us, the band guys, coming up with the arrangement and making it make sense and convey the point of the song in that small amount of time. Because mm-hmm. if you got ten contestants on the show in the early yeah. episodes, you got it. You got to really condense stuff. Was there a musical director in that situation? Yes. Okay. Yeah, but he, and and on that sh- on that show it was a uh, uh, John Bollinger, um, and he was with that show from day one. And he was a guitar player yeah. and fantastic musician. And, um, but he was like great producers. He was smart enough to always lean on, hey, you know, y'all got ideas. He, he wouldn't come in and go, well, here it is. You know, he would lean on all of us to come up and throw our ideas in mm-hmm. and, and make it, make it all work. Mm-hmm. And, um, because he had his hands full with so many other details and so many things, you know. And, and a lot of times the artist would come in and actually have an arrangement written, you know, an idea. And, and the better artists and singers would. Uh, and people like Chris Young, who's gone on to in- incredible success. Right, right. Chris was, was, the last year I was on was the year Chris won. And Chris is an excellent musician and writer. He would come in and go, here's what I have in mind. And just play through his arrangement. And boom, there it was. We'd just be taking notes and going, okay, yeah, that works. And we might offer a what little a suggestion. Changed. Yeah, yeah, what a nice relief. And then other people would come in and go, well, I got this song. They wouldn't even know the words hardly, you know. And we would have to just spoon feed them the whole thing. And go, dude, here's the arrangement. You know, we would have to just make, come from a blank slate. And, you know, so that, that happened a lot. But we would... Um, uh, t- uh, on broadcast day, we would come in at like uh, nine or ten a.m. and we would rehearse uh, camera blocking. So we, we would run through the show in, in real time, best we could, and <clears throat> um, they would be re- rehearsing lighting cues and camera angles as we're rehearsing, yeah. just running through the show. We do a rundown early morning, it kind of a rough rundown, and then in the afternoon we would come in and do quote address rehearsal and that's where they really got the camera angles and stuff down okay. and really dialed it in and, and they would have the script ironed out by then and the host would know what they're saying and they would have things written out they would even shoot and idol would do this too they would even shoot dress rehearsal because we would be dressed then they would shoot that 
and in the afternoon and inter, and intersplice that during the live broadcast. So if you ever see portions are pre-recorded, that's because they would use the the uh, the shoulder mount handheld cameras. And, and, and Idol invented this trick. Um, if you're down front singing, there'd be a cameraman walking around you doing that circular shot, you know, going all around your body. They would shoot that in rehearsal because they can't shoot that during the live show. Right, right. And so they would enter, they would fly that in while we're doing the live broadcast. Yeah. And you'd never know it because we're, we're all wearing the same clothes. And okay. da, da, da. yeah. But anyway, it, but we'd do that. And, and then the show would, we would do a, a run through late afternoon. And then the show would air live at, I think, eight o'clock. We get a meal break at six, and then we we shoot it at, at eight, and it was in real time. You know that was that. It's an all day. Yeah, all yeah. Day. On broadcast days, all day long day. I'd go take a nap sometimes. It it, you know, six o'clock. Curl it, curl up inside the kitchen. I would. I'd I'd go in my car, go to the dressing room, and just lay down for fifteen twenty minutes, just kind of rest your brain. It was mentally so exhausting because you're as the drummer, you've got an ear. You, the band leader. And yourself, a lot of times, would uh, we all had we're all on ears, and you'd have a director in your head counting down, and you're you're not only playing the ten songs for the contestants, you're playing all the bumps in and out, you're playing all the all the breaks to commercial break. That's what I was going to ask you. Just um, uh, just like Letterman. The CMT Video Awards still have a live band, and I've done that one a few times. Nice. And that uh, the CMA Awards don't. That's all pre pre record music. Okay. So when you hear the walk on walk off music, that's yeah. all pre record. Mm-hmm. And and there's not really a house one house band set up backing up many different artists. That's how the CMAs are done, done now. So yeah. which is kind of a drag. But the CMA the CMT Video Music Awards. I'm sorry. Yeah is run like that and so I, that's the one i've done and that's and that's live live yeah. that's the one that can be sheer terror for musicians who who haven't done that before um <clears throat> it because it's the same deal you're not only are you backing up several different artists and learning their songs but you're doing all the cues i should have brought a cue sheet on one of those shows we have 20 25 to 30 music cues in that show Meaning, um, when the presenters walk out, I have the time from when they come out of that curtain to walk 10 feet to the podium. So I've got a, a, a band leader or director in my head going, okay, stand by, stand by, here's it comes, three, two. As he's counting down in my head, I'm going, I'm, and I'm giving the guys count off. So one, two, you know, but I give them short TV count off. So it's never a one, two, one, two. It's always a three, four, boom, da, 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 oh, you're in. Yeah. So it's all short TV. You need to keep in time. So I, I'm softly on my leg, giving the guys a tempo. I'm going, remember, it's a swing. It's a swing thing. Mm-hmm. So it, say it's a cheap cheap trick groove, you know. One, two, three, four. Dun, uh, 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 you know, and then the next bump is a Roy Orbison Pretty Woman yeah. groove. The next bump is a Latin thing. The next bump is is a straight ahead train beat country thing. You know, they're all different styles depending on what the theme is to that award or that particular person. Or if it's a movie person that walks out, we might play – a movie theme or something, you know, yeah, yeah, so yeah. they have different presenters, but it, to answer your question, they're in my head, they're counting down in my head. I'm counting up and the band's all watching me. And then my job is to, as they're walking out, we're playing the groove, we're playing. And when they get to the podium, I have to make, I have to do a cutoff to make sure it makes musical sense. So when they get to the podium and get set, that's when I cut off. And so everybody's just watching me and, and the, and the band director, uh, the band leader, and um, so that's a big part of is it always the award on a show. Downbeat or are hopefully, not- <laughs> hopefully, <Yeah. laughs> I try to make it and make it. Yeah, I always go back and watch the replay of the, of the show to make sure I nailed every one of them. Make sure yeah. any way I can prove next year, you know. And that's that's can be nerve wracking if you've never done it before because it, it's yeah. because you're it's all real, really, really heads up visual cue. You've got to be able to see the the stage and the podium and what's going on. Yeah. And you got voices in your head the whole time, and I've got a script in my hand. I've got a script down below my hi hat, and I'm reading the script the whole time to see. The script is not so much every word; it's it's the it's the timeline of what's happening. It's the show rundown. 
And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking ahead, and it'll have a segment of the show, the link of that segment, mm-hmm. meaning, okay, here's the, here's the award, here's the presenting award for best male vocal, and it'll go, and that, that segment should last 30 seconds. Then they'll, then they'll go to a video. Here's the, a video of all the nominees, and then they'll go, all right, presentation of the award. You know, it has each little segment blocked out, and then and then when that segment's done, I go, oh, here's a bump. I've got a we've got a bump bump bumper music to get us into commercial, um, and so I'm I'm always looking ahead, and the next you never get too far ahead. The o- only thing you look at is what's next on your cue sheet, yes. and you look at that. And I go, okay, I've got a five second bump. It's a swing thing. Okay, great. There's three more awards, and then I've got a rock and roll, you know, Zeppelin kind of crazy bump going coming back in from commercial you know and so you're always looking ahead at, at what the next style is and how long it is and oh yeah i've, I've got to play this song with you know with luke bryan's coming out we got to play his song or whatever you know yeah. so you you yeah. you, you, you just you, you can only take it one thing at a time because you can't get ahead right right <laughs> and do, does everyone else in the band have that feed or you no one? okay just me so okay. just me and and the the music director, the music director. and 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 so we're me and him are just eye locking the whole time on stuff and and i'm always i'm always real good about about reminding the guys okay it's this bump you know it's a swamp boogie bump Here's the tempo, and everybody's looking back at me because you can't hear it. The crowd is so loud. It's in the arena, as you know, yeah. and the, the crowd noise is so deafening that, I mean, they're re- the, the guys are reading lips, and I, and I do have a count-off mic, and so if we can get everybody but on ears, ears I've got ears, but Does a lot of the guys, some of the guys, some of the guys do and some don't, so oh, I make okay. sure that they can hear my count-off mic, and yeah, it, it's, it's, those can be nerve-wracking. I, I just... Um, after doing Nashville Star one season, you it was either sink or swim. And and I remember doing my first couple episodes and and we all as a band really um, really learned very quickly mm-hmm. and, and we had a really good musical executive producer, a guy a guy named John Small, who has done countless music videos and countless T V specials. And in his former life he was a drummer. And so he was really good about coaching me up really quick and going, here's what needs to happen and how, and here's how you can do it, and here's how you can help the band. Here's how you can help the contestants, because the contestants would be 50 feet away from me, way downstage, and I'm way on the back. Yes. And yeah. you'd have guys looking back, and so I'd give them really good count-offs, and, and I would, they would look at me before we'd come on stage sometimes, and I'd kind of give them the tempo, you know. Yeah. And, and, and But John was really good about coaching me up and – Give give me helpful hints on how to how to be helpful to everybody else because right. the, in those situations you know the, we're keeping the train on the tracks period right. the drummer right. is I mean contrary to what other band members might think yeah <laughs> that's well I mean and that's that's what I love about this because it's a very unique situation and yeah. and that was going to be one of my questions is were there certain things I think as drummers were you have to kind of listen to your instincts and know, well, you know what, this is going to have to be a quick count off. Or I want to make mm-hmm. sure that everyone on mm-hmm. ears or off ears or whatever can see and hear the mm-hmm. count off, whatever the situation. So some of that stuff, I'm sure you had to make some judgment calls right on the spot. Oh, yeah. But you had that you had and, a and bit of coaching. I, I did. Well. And, and what helped me was, and, and they didn't even think of this, I said, let me see the teleprompter or let me see the script so I know what the the present the presenters or the hosts last line is. Yes. So if I know those last few words, I said I can make it seamless. If you give me this the the, the the script, I can make it seamless. There'll be no dead air but between their last word and when you want a downbeat. Yes. And they're like, Oh wow, that's a great idea. I said, Yeah. Well, okay. And they started <laughs> doing it, you know. And, or, or or they put it where I could see the the teleprompter that the host is reading yeah. and and I would sit there and read as he's doing it, and I see that last word. I'm like three, four. I'm actually counting as he's saying the last word. Yes. So when he finishes his last word, it's like boom, music. Right. And so they really like the, the director wow. really liked that, wow. making it seamless, and and that's how the award show like it too. Because the award shows a lot of times you're coming back from a video package, you're you're coming back from they'll show a video of, of whatever, and when it comes back from video, they want it seamless. You know, no dead air, and so that's that's if you can nail that every time, you you've made them really happy. And and and, you know. and currently, you're on the show Nashville. Mm-hmm. And um, how does that 
differ from what you're talking about. I know you're talking totally, about wood chip. Right. <clears throat> That's a totally different animal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nashville is shot like a movie. So, meaning uh, a lot of sing- single camera shots, but it's actually, you know, it's filmed. Obviously, it's filmed. It's not live. So, they shoot it um, just like a movie in that we do a lot of takes of any given scene. And, and any given take, the cameras are in different positions. Yeah. And then in one take, there might be a cameraman right over my shoulder shooting from my point of view. I mean, the dude, I mean, seriously, the thing's like resting on my shoulder, you know, <laughs> or there'd be a jib behind me shooting, coming up, you know, like yeah. that, you know, coming yeah. up like this thing above my head to, to give a big wide panoramic sh- view of, yeah. of the whole scene of the arena, right. you know, from my point of view, which is awesome. Yeah. There've been a couple of angles where when we shot at the bluebird a couple of times where we, we did a bunch of takes of this one song, <clears throat> And the bluebird's so small that the bluebird set so small, rather. Right, right. <laughs> and it's an identical copy, by yes, the way. Yeah. We did one. This was last season. We'd never done this, and we did a bunch of takes. And the director's like, "Let's let's get it from the stage point of view, from the drummer's point of view." I was like, "Oh, great, you know, cool." Well, there's no room there, so they so they. If you know the bluebird set, the drums are on are, are backed up against the wall anyway. You're already hitting your elbows on the wall because it's so tiny, and and the artist literally. If, he, if she took a step back, her back end would be on your kick drum. I mean, it's yeah. that the yeah. stage is not that deep. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm thinking, oh, cool. That, well, and then, okay, you're going to shoot from my point of view. Well, what are you going to sit in my lap? And they're, they're like, oh, no. <laughs> they took out the wall behind me, took out the drum kit, and, and shot it from my point of view, me, meaning it, it looked like the cameraman was sitting on the drum throne, but I wasn't even the shot. <laughs> so they, they took out the wall behind me, removed the drum kit, put the put the main camera right where the drum throne would have been, yes. and shot the whole scene. And all you see is Raina, Raina, Connie Britton's back, and you see the you know all the crowds looking at you, and you see the whole bluebird. But it was totally the way you and me would see it as a right, drummer, exactly. you know. So they started doing that camera angle last year, which yeah. you know knocked me out of the, that knocked me out of that point of view. But but then when they shot all the shots from the front, you, of course you see me and everything. But right, right, it was a really right. cool use of a camera because it, it it you don't often get that view of the drummer's point of view. That's true. That's true. Well, there's a great... and, and, and they cut in the footage for that particular song. They they use they use that shot a bunch, which is kind of funny, yeah. you know. So I'm in all these front shots, and and then they they do the cutaway of my point of view, yeah, which. Yeah. Was really, but they couldn't do that with the real. Mm-mm. No, there's it no was way. It was just there Tuesday, and they said, yeah, "Well, you know, they started shooting there, but then they rebuilt the set." To they did, and, and they, it's good because you can't take out the wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they literally, they literally took the wall small. out from behind me, and I'm sitting behind the camera, going, "Yeah, that's pretty accurate." And that was a couple of seasons, which was basically duet. American Idol for duets because the Idol people produced it. They came in from LA and produced it. Um, oh, I forgot one. The, the one oddball. So my band Six Wire, we were on Fox TV's the the next great American band, which was America. And I was a, we were contestants on that. So it was a band. It was an American Idol show for bands. And it's so funny they they auditioned. I don't know ten thousand bands, whatever it was, or some obscene number of bands. And we kept making the cut, kept making the cut. We got on the show, had to move to L.A. for three months and compete. And we, me and the band picked up and moved out there. And they, they, housed, they housed us in the same complex as Idol and all that stuff. And um, the Idol, Idol people, this is back in 07. The funny thing is, the band, that in, the, the top three bands from this show in the whole country were all Nashville based bands <laughs> and we were all totally different we're this big rock and country vocal band the guys that um, uh, there was another band uh, that was a big horn band real uh, energetic up tempo uh, um, um, oh gosh I'm blanking on the name Denver Denver and the Mile High Orchestra which is this great band of oh, all yeah. incredible musicians, but they're yeah. totally different. They're like Oingo Boingo or something. They're, they're totally different than us. Sure. And then, and then there was another trio of brothers, the Clock Brothers, who were bluegrassers, who yeah. were all great singers and musicians. And but the top three bands of the whole show were all Nashville bands, and we were all completely different. You're all living in Nashville. I mean, you're all yeah, living yeah. in LA. We're all, yeah, we're all living in LA, and and 
and we all hung out together all the time and did stuff. We were in the same apartment complex and, and you know, that was really cool. But anyway, that, that was the one show we did as contestants, you know. And then, um, but what's funny is that that show, that was in 07, the Idol people, they produced it and, and they were great people. And this is, this is uh, um, Nigel. And they took a liking to us and from that one show, that led to all these other shows. They wanted us to be their house band on all these other shows because they just liked our band in, in, in that we could play so many different styles yeah. and play them pretty authentically that they're like, man, we got to use you guys. So they, they went out of their way to throw us all sorts of work because we all sing and you know we play different instruments. And so being on that Fox show led us to be on the house band for all these CMT shows, you know, as a band. Yeah. And then we would, we would bring in extra pieces as needed. Like if, if, if a certain episode of Can You Duet needed a fiddle player, we'd bring in a fiddle player. Or if we needed extra keys, we'd bring in a key, you know, mm-hmm. or um, um, we have a, a dear friend, Jonathan Yudkin, who's an incredible string player. He plays cello and viola and play, plays everything. And we, he's like our, we bring him in for certain things, you right, know. So right, it right. just depends on what the episode required. But, but our band as a unit is a five piece, three guitars and bass and drums and, okay. and all that. So, but the idol people were great to us and they, they still are to this day. They, they, you know, everything's related, everything. And, and that's how we got the gig on the TV show Nashville as well. Yeah. In that, um, it's kind of funny how I hadn't really thought about it, but it, it is one big, long, related timeline from from 07 till now. In, in that, um, when the TV show Nashville came to town, they were they were just going to shoot a pilot episode, and so the music director of the Opry, Steve Gibson, mm-hmm. he calls me up and said, and he's a friend. I had worked done sessions with him and whatnot for years. And he's a big producer and um, incredible musician. He calls up me and Andy, our lead singer, and he, he called me personally and said, "Man, they're they're ABCs coming to town. They're going to shoot this pilot, and we need a band to be the band for the, the star, Raina. You know, Connie Connie Britton. You know, the redhead." I was like, Connie Britton, are you kidding me? Whatever she's doing, I'm in. You know, <laughs> I just I just I just love her. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, but no, but he said he and he was in, in full disclosure. He was like, look, they're, they're shoot a pilot. They need a band because she her character is kind of a a compilation of of. <clears throat> her character is a you know forty something. She's this established big superstar. She's kind of a, a composite character of of Faith Hill meets Martina meets maybe a, a, an older uh, a Reba or something. Okay. You know, it's just sure. her character is this composite character. And, and so she's a superstar and she needs this band to be her band and you're going to be in a bunch of scenes in a pilot episode. And I kind of was rolling my eyes going, well... I mean, come on, you know, every time when L.A. people come here, you know, they put hay bales out on the front of the stage and wagon wheels and make it all yeah, hillbilly. And yeah, yeah. he started laughing. He goes, no, man. <laughs> I said, because I said, because I said, if it's that, we're not interested. But and, he, and we're laughing. He goes, no, thankfully, the main creator and the main writer of the show is Callie Corey, who has spent a lot of time in Nashville. She She's from here. Her husband is T-Bone Burnett. Oh, she knows the deal. Yeah. She's not going to make us look like Hicks. All of us, you know, just a few, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, the Nashville <laughs> community, you know, I said, OK, I said, what's the details? What's the he goes, well, it, it's going to involve probably three days of your time. I said, OK, um, when's it start shooting? I said, because, you know, we're real musicians. We can't we're real touring musicians. We can't do um, we, we can't do weekends. He goes, no, no, we'll, we'll work at a, we, uh, they, they realize that now and they're going to shoot the music scenes Monday through Thursdays. Probably. I said, okay, well, it's just a pilot. This one off. Okay, sure. We'll do it. And so we arranged, <clears throat> but of course it was sheer hell going through it to, to make that happen because they called me with a few weeks notice. And we, as a band, we all talked about it and we all said the same thing. Like, oh, great. They're going to do hay bales and wagon wheels and we're going to be wearing sequins or what, you know? And, and mm-hmm. I'm like, no, no, no. They assured me. Cause there were some questions within the band. We were like, I don't know. Do we want to do this? And, and a few of us, I, I'm like, look, it's TV. I trust Steve Gibson and, and Pete Fisher, the general, general manager of the Opry. They, and they've known us, they've seen our band play a lot. And, and they, and, and, and another another nice thing is Steve's words were, "You guys have a unit have done more TV 
than anybody in town. Yeah. You guys know the drill. And a, a lot of people have recommended you guys to the producer. So this yeah. is your gig if you want it. I was like, oh, well, that, that's kind of cool. And and so the funny thing was they shot, they started shooting the pilot on a Monday. Two of us played with Richard Marks's band. We had to red eye back on a Sunday from Vegas. I played Sunday night in Vegas. Me and the bass player from Six Wire have been in Richard's band forever. We red-eyed back. I made it on set by 9 a.m., and I was doing hair and makeup by 9.15, and we were filming by 10. You needed all the hair and makeup you uh, could get. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I needed all of it. <laughs> get those big raccoon eyes out. Yeah, you know, and, oh and, but so, I'll, you know, we were kind of, well, I hope this works out. Well, it was a pilot episode, so... <clears throat> our first scene was we're, we're at the Opry shooting her big concert scene of her big debut or not debut, but her big, this massive, you know, victory lap triumphal scene of this superstar at, at the Opry house. And that was the first scene we shot for the pilot. And it was this huge scene. And, um, and, but they shot it like a movie. So they did, since it was the pilot, they took a lot of extra time, and we must have, we must have done a hundred takes oh, of this okay. one. It, the, the, the scene was we were doing some backstage stuff, and then we walk on, and we played the song, we played the whole song, and then we walk off, and we mingle around side stage, and, and they and so they shot every angle of every every part of that scene you could think of, <laughs> and. We we're like, holy smoke! So this is what movie making is like. Good lord! I was, you know, I was really fresh the first fifty takes, but take eighty one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> producing the smut line. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, so it, it was that situation, and so it was, it was great. We made some dear friends. We hit it off really good with Charles Eston, Chip, you know, and his characters, Deacon. Okay. We hit it off great with him. And between takes, and there is a lot of downtime too because they have to reset and reset all the camera jibs and all this junk and, and move the extras to another section and they would cut and paste and and, and instead of having 3,000 people in the room, they had maybe 500. And they would move And them. they would just move them. Yes. And then they would cut and paste so it looked like the Opry was totally full when it wasn't. It's the yes. same way they shot like the, the Gladiator right. Russell Crowe movie, you know, in the Coliseum. Same exact yeah. thing. Great band in that movie. Uh, yeah. The house band. But, house. Yeah. But so Chip would come, and here's how we hit it off with Chip. He would come in between takes because we, we would be in our dressing room at the Opry with everybody's got acoustics and we're just in there playing and singing and having a great time. And Chip would come hang out in our room. And that's how we became dear friends. We were in there playing covers and doing all this stuff. And he, yeah. we were just killing time and we had the best time. Yeah. And Chip's like, man, I've got these songs I wrote and I need a recording band. You guys want to record? And, and yeah. sure. Yeah. So that's how we became his recording band. He literally after, later that week, he goes, I got to fly back to LA. He came in that morning and we recorded two or three of his songs for him in three hours and he had to catch a plane yeah. and they all turned out great. He was happy. And then, well, it's like, Hey man, great meeting you. And we had fun shooting the pilot and we thought, ah, eh, you know, whatever. Well, it turns out the show got picked up right? and, right. and, it, it, and then it became wildly successful yeah. and we were the band. They, they said, you got the gig. We want you to be regulars on the show. And so season one, we did several episodes and I mean, they shoot in a full season. There's 20, episode or 22 episodes and we were in i don't know maybe a third of them okay and it's been that way every yeah every season now but that's how that came about it was just through relationships and through all these people knowing that we had done all this tv in the past the other gigs that uh keep you busy you, you mentioned richard marks mm -hmm. and you've been working with him for quite some time yeah that's a great Great, great gig. He, um, Richard's, Richard's weird in that he, some years we're really busy and other years we're not. Like yeah. this year, we only did a handful of full band dates because he's doing um, some solo dates. Yeah. And then Richard's a big studio rat. He likes to be Mr. Producer, songwriter guy. So he's totally content okay. just being in the studio and doing that. But I've got to do some really cool gigs with him over the years. Yeah. He, uh, he's done, <clears throat> he would do this once, once a year benefit for Ronald McDonald House up in Chicago. 
and we would have a guest star every year, and we would do a little little Richard, a, 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 like a mini Richard set, and then bring out the guest star. And it was always a surprise. Well, like we've had Olivia Newton John, we come in and play a little a, Richard set. Like yeah, a little Lucy. Richard. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh <laughs> a little, oh, a small <laughs> Richard Marks. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay, a mini, a mini Richard set. We do you know, a short show. Is what I'm trying okay. to say. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but he he's friends with everybody, so he would. Yeah. He'd get Kenny Rogers one year, nice. who I'd worked with a bunch of times before that, you know, playing with Richard, and and he remembers me every time. He's amazing, Kenny. He's yes. so sharp. But I'm getting I'm getting off track. But you know, Olivia Newton John would come in, and and just all these different people because he knows everybody. And um, those are some of the fun things we did. And then I've done um, <clears throat> one of the things I'm was most proud of, or, or, or had the most fun was we. Um, we recut a greatest hits for Richard um, a few years ago, and if you know the Richard hits, he he had Jeff Picaro on some, uh, J R Robinson, uh, Jonathan Moffat, he said uh, Pat Mastellato. Um, he, he's had a, a lot of really heavy heavy hitter yeah, guys yeah. play on his records way back in the day in the eighties and nineties, and he said, I want to recreate this as close to the record as I can, but Put in a little of your stuff. Feel free. Don't go crazy, but, you know, just put your stamp on some of this. So it was a blast for me to go in and really study those records and then and, and really stay close to them, but maybe on the fade, add a few little little yeah. fangs or, yeah. or add, a, add, add something that we had been doing live that weren't necessarily on the record. You know how songs evolve after you've played them for a few years. Mm-hmm. If you've done an artist, you know, you, 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 the artist – Either they get bored or they just want to add more musical right, little right. musical ideas to right. something that he's already been playing for five years or whatever. Sure. And so we did that on, on so we did this this greatest hit C D called Stories to Tell. And it was we we re redid some of the more of the bigger iconic hits. And I ended up being on most of the album. And I got to I got to do It Don't Mean Nothing oh, and Satisfied yeah. and Endless Summer Nights and Hold On to the Night. Yeah. It's the big, huge yeah. ballad. Right. Um, so I got to recreate and redo all those. And then that same year we played we did we, Richard is he's one of those artists that he does pretty well in the States, but overseas he's is um, in, in 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 Europe and Asia, he's huge. Like we go over there and we, we're playing arenas and we're playing big Bonnaroo festivals and we're playing like in India and the Ukraine and Taiwan wow. and all over Europe and and um, Indonesia and and um, we played that year. We did Royal Albert Hall, you know, oh, and amazing. sold it out. And it was that was one of my bucket list venues, That's you know, so. which is a really great venue to play. Um, but uh, that same year, we, we we did all those cool dates, and this is just a couple of years ago. And then we did a live DVD that we filmed here called uh, uh, "Richard Marks: a, a Night Out with Friends." It was it was going to be it was a PBS special. Mm-hmm. They ended up keeping the whole thing and making a big double DVD set out of it. And um, <clears throat> so he invited uh, one of the guys from In Sync because Richard had wrote uh, this. I promise you. A big hit for them. He wrote and he actually produced that record. So we, we had one of the guys come in from there, um, and then the big actor um, Hugh Hugh Jackman came in. When who I was when I was doing some background was, research on you, you had listed <laughs> Hugh Jackman, and I was like, wait a minute, what? What is this? It's crazy. That guy, you just hate him. You absolutely hate him. Not only <laughs> is he a, a, a talented actor, but he was brought up in musical theater. So he's a he can sing, That's he right. can dance. He he's he's an athlete. Movie. He's yeah, he's yeah. Wolverine, you know. And Wolverine. he's the nicest freaking guy. Absolute seems sweetheart. Like it. Seems like it. You know. And him and Richard are big pals. So he was a guest star, and and he come in. He, he came in, and he was. He's like. I'm I'm out of my element. I never sang in rock bands. This is my rock and roll moment. Right, right. <laughs> he, he's like, I'm a musical theater guy. Right, right. And so we're playing through all this stuff, and we ended up doing. He did a he did a big ballad that Richard wrote uh, from Michael Bublé, I believe it was, or I'm sorry, Josh um, Grayson. Gosh. Josh and Groban? A Groban. I was, okay. I, my brain is fried. I'm sorry. Right. I need more coffee. <laughs> yeah, Josh. <laughs> something, something. Yeah, Josh Groban. Um, and so 
Hugh sang that, which is totally in his wheelhouse, a big soaring orchestral ballad, you know, yeah. and, and then he, 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 I want to do, you know, more rock songs. And so we, we worked up, um, the box tops, um, or more, actually more Joe Cocker's version of the letter, you know, we were doing kind of the halftime groove and I went into the, you know, that, that kind of groove, um, which is the double time section that they do on Joe Cocker live. And he was like, yeah, 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 let's do that. I like that feel, you know? Yeah. And so we ended up just doing that the whole song. song. And he was like, yeah, this is my rock and roll moment. And he's running around and jumping and, and doing these kicks. And Gosh. I said, Hugh, you do your thing. I will catch those kicks and you cue the ending. And we just let him go wild. And he, he, he had the best time. And, you know, that was just one of those oddball. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm sitting there pinching myself going all right i'm on stage with hugh jackman you know and 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 it became um they made a dvd out of it and 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 now people a lot of people who didn't know me before saw me on that and people would send me notes or and letters and or you know little email things and um it's just you never know where things end up you know when, when you film something you, you never know right. where who will see it um we have a guy we have this leads to another thing uh, there was a um a, a a wonderful artist songwriter who saw us at royal albert hall and he's a big richard fan and he um he sent me a note saying man i've got these songs and i would really like to get you guys to play on it i, I like what do you mean like i goes like richard's band yeah. i said oh well Individually, we all we all we already we all do a lot of internet tracks and Skype sessions all the time. Like I have clients all over the world that I play on stuff for, you know, which is very common these days. And um, and he saw us at Royal Albert, and and he lives in France. He came all the way to London to see us, and and he lives in France and spends a lot of time in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam. So anyway, fast forward, we've now been working with this guy for years. And we do all his his recordings, yeah. and it's all through Skype and internet tracks. And 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 we we just do. He'll be on Skype with us, and we come in and record as a band, and we let him hear the playback as we're playing, as we're doing it. And he's like, yeah, you know. And so he's there with us on the laptop, just watching. And so I, we have a lot of clients like that that we do. We do. So you're not doing just like, hey, send me these tracks with a click, but but you're. you're I, the, I do some of those, some but of that, but you've got the Skype going as well. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I prefer that because it, it 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 lets the writer producer feel like they're a part of it. And they have some some input and some say so, and and we can get immediate feedback of, oh, do you like that? Do you like what we did on the bridge, or you know, is that what you had in mind? Because because yeah. you as a drummer, you know, you sometimes you hear a song and you can think of five different ways you could play it, mm-hmm. and I'll right. do that, right. and I'll do that. I go, well, okay, here's my here's my first thought, but let me give you three or four other grooves or approaches, yes. and I'll do that, and and when you got Skype, he can just immediately tell you, yeah, yeah, I love it, and so I actually prefer that. You know, if we can do it, if it's technically possible. And some studios it is, some it isn't. It just depends on, you know, your setup. And is it a separate feed? So you've got Skype going on, or, or are you sending the tracks through Skype? I, no, we actually, we actually, with this particular uh, guy, we 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 don't send him the tracks directly we just we record them into the pro tools rig and he just he's just hearing the playback over the speakers oh, nice. just to make sure we're 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 musically doing what what he wants cuz he knows sonically it's going to be great and he'll love it and so we when we're done recording all the tracks we send it to him and he does his vocals and then gets it mixed and then he'll send it back and go what do you think you know and and we'll give him a little We'll go and we'll give him our feedback about the mix, you know, like, well, you might want to do this and, and you know, I mean, maybe. I mean, how much different is, is that than being in a studio where you're in a booth somewhere and the guy's in another room? I mean, you hardly see each other in the studio as it is, let mm-hmm. alone. Oh, I know. It's amazing. You probably see the person more on Skype than you I know. Do. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and then we have other accounts where they just totally trust us and they'll send real good demos and me and the engineer and, and maybe a small rhythm section will just go in and do tracks for people. And we just and they totally trust us and we'll just do the tracks and, we, and like everybody else, and like a lot of yeah. other guys, and we just email them back. And we have I, clients it, like that too. And, it reminded me of a couple of things. Uh, you mentioned Chris Young, who, who you worked with, and, mm-hmm. uh, and a mutual friend, Mason Embry, 
Oh yeah, yeah. I Love had a chance to tour with him uh, about three years ago, and actually oh, cool. we, we got a chance to meet. We do a lot of stuff with him, right? And and I remember he was working on some stuff, and and he was playing some stuff for me that uh, you had played on, man. And when we were out on tour, he was mixing stuff. He goes, "Yeah, I got Chuck Tilly on this." Oh, and cool. We did this guy's. Uh, he was huge in Germany. I think. oh oh this girl, the, the the Swiss German rocker. He's from Switzerland. He's huge over there. Yes, we recorded that, and yeah, yeah. Mason produced. It? Mason that was a blast. We did that at Quad. That was a blast. Well, that was an interesting thing, and I, and I don't know. It, it's it seems like a thing where you talked about Richard being huge in Europe and yeah, and, and you know overseas and different places. Well, there seems to be this whole or or even the the you know re-recording Richard's hits mm-hmm. and reproducing them and making them maybe more modern sounding and all, that's what all that. we did exactly well and, you, and that's what Mason was doing with this guy who was huge oh that's there. right but Mason those were played, hits you're right he played some of those that. old tracks for me yeah and I was like wow that is not good production <laughs> Because that was you're right. That he, was it. When, when we when, their hits, they're huge. That's what happened when, when he played us. Those we're like, are these demos? He's like, oh no, these were huge hits in Europe. I was like, are you kidding me? Right. I said, I've heard better demos done on laptops in the back of a bus, you know, than. <laughs> it had to be easy work. Just to well, here's the song, here's the form, whatever. <sighs> we just got to play it, but with better sounds. That's what it was, and and, and he he was and this guy's the nicest guy. He's he's a Swiss, lives in Switzerland, speaks Swiss German, which is his own dialect. It's different than than other parts of, of Switzerland and then other parts of Germany because, wow. like my son sp- speaks German, yeah. and I said, listen to this record, and he's like, doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He goes, it's different. That's, a, that's a different dialect. He goes, I don't know any of those words in, in the whole, you know, the whole records in, in, in Swiss German. That was really interesting. But was really it was a blast. He was, he was so much fun. And Mason did a great job producing that. And they, they sent us a gold record. We got a gold record out of that in Europe. That is amazing. Like six months after it came out. I am from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, originally, and I've been here, wow, since 87. Um, I've, I've actually lived here longer than where I grew up, so I feel like a local, actually, yeah, really, it's, really, it's, it's weird. But yeah, I grew up in Tuscaloosa, um, and Tuscaloosa is a college town, so the University, University of Alabama is, Roll Tide, and um, it, it's a, a musically... There's a lot going. There's always been a lot going on there, mm-hmm. always because it's you had a really good music school there. You have a very vibrant bar scene and music club scene there. And when I grew up there, you know, in the um, well, I was coming of age in the late late seventies, early eighties, you know, before college. Um, it, there's just always a big live music scene there, and so I was always in in rock bands. Doing whatever the cover the cover bands were doing then, you know, late seventies and early eighties, we were doing Sticks and Journey and and Kiss and everything else you can think of, you know. I, I, I didn't, I wasn't playing any country then, but there's a great scene in Tuscaloosa and musically. So I was playing bars. Then the drinking age was nineteen, and you could play in bars if you didn't drink, and you stayed away from the bar. You couldn't sit sit at the bar, and so I was seventeen. I started oh, wow. playing playing in, in some bars there because yeah. and there's a huge you know and and then start playing frat parties and all that stuff. So it, long story short, I I went to college there because they had a really really good music school um, at the time. There, there was a man there, um, Steve Sample. It was his name, Professor Steve Sample, who taught arranging and he ran the big band. And the big band was in the style of Count Basie, Buddy Rich style big band oh, program. Cool. Yeah. Really really slamming program and he put out a lot of really good players and i wanted to go there and study under him and and the, and the was he a drum instructor or no no this is he was the big band he was a trombone player and writer arranger yeah but i wanted to, uh, i wanted to, to study with him because he put out a lot of really good players and a lot of really good drummers and he, he knew how to coach them up mm-hmm. and and make them great musicians yeah. i learned more from him than i did any any percussion instructor ever they have almost the exact same story. Which, which is crazy trombone player arranger big band 
yeah. from my from my history. Yeah. But the, and the, yeah, the, and so that but that was crazy. my background. Yeah. And, and then, but but my percussion instructor there, Larry Mathis, was a Juilliard grad who studied under Saul Goodman, and his forte was timpani. So my scholarship and my for, my focus was actually timpani and orchestral percussion. So my whole thing was I, I wanted to play timpani, and so what was cool about Alabama is. Unlike, you know, North Texas or Berkeley or wherever, which are all wonderful schools, you've got 400 drummers there. Well, at Alabama, it was a much, much smaller program. Right. And so I got a lot more more time in the chair and a lot more attention because there were maybe, you know, 20 or, 20 or 30 guys at most. But w- what was fun for me was I got to do marching band, which is drum corps style. I got to do marching band. I was the timpanist in the orchestra. Mm-hmm. All the Broadway shows that came through in local theater, I did all the musical theater. I, I played West Side Story, Brigadoon, Annie, you name a musical, I probably played it in the pit, playing drum set and percussion. It sounds like it prepared you for it, television shows it, it, and all the things you're man, doing Man, that's that was the deal. Yeah. In that, that's why I was so glad I went there because I, I worked as a freshman. I came in there and there were some upperclassmen who were just incredible, and they really showed you real quick what you needed to do as a player to 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 practice and get better and study because you're you know you're you coming in as a freshman you're just getting your butt kicked around by juniors and seniors and, sure. and grad students sure. and it was very motivating for me mm-hmm. I mean it, it it made me mad that that I was so low on the food chain and and wasn't didn't just come in and was the first chair, you know. I mean, yeah, hey, right. Hell no, you know, yeah. freshman, freshman, you're not playing snare drum your freshman year. Right. You're gonna play quads, you know, which is fine. I was thrilled to do. It. I actually wanted to play quads, and um, but but I got to do everything there. I, I got to do you know orchestra and jazz band and, and every little bebop combo they had, and then and on the side. I'm I'm playing frat parties in my cover band rock band, mm-hmm. and doing society gigs, wearing a tux, playing big band gigs and right. wedding receptions and bar mitzvahs and and every little special event you could think of. So I just I never slept. I mean it was I never wasted time. I, I rarely slept to prepare you for not sleeping it, now. Exactly, <laughs> it was a great. Take but a literally, I would I would sleep in my practice room. I, I had my own little room with with my drum set, and I would literally sleep in there a lot because oh, I'd have an eight a.m. class. Yeah. And yeah. I'd just go in the restroom down the hall, brush my teeth, and kind of freshen up, put on a hat, and roll into <laughs> 8 a.m. music theory. <laughs> I did that a lot. Right. But it was a, great, it was a great, great preparation in that he, he prepared you for being a studio guy. You, 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 there was sight reading all the time. Like, we were, you know, you're reading these seven-page big band charts. You know, right. we got to have two music stands, and they're six feet long, right. and, and you learn how to read that stuff. Yeah. And so that, that was a great training ground for me. And, and that I, But I was still doing frat parties and all that stuff and making good money, you know. Mm-hmm. So I did that all through school. And then a big, a big thing for me was during the summers, I had, a, I had the fortunate, the good fortune of going up to Eastman School of Music and studying during the summers. No, up in New York. It's in Rochester, New York. And Eastman is, you know, it's on the level of a Miami or Berkeley or North Texas or yeah. Indiana, some of the better, really good jazz schools. And I would go up there in the summers. My whole reason to go up there was my idol and one of my biggest influences was Steve Gadd. Because Gadd, the reason was because he plays everything so well and so authentic. And he's got the jazz background, big band, and he's, he's got the military snare stuff. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to go study with his teacher. So John Beck was still there at the time. And Mr. Beck had been um, at Eastman since the 60s, since Gad was there. Yeah. And he was still there in the 80s when I was going up there. And he was also a principal timpanist of the Rochester Philharmonic. So I would study orchestral percussion with Mr. Beck. And he's like, well, what do you want to work on? You know, yeah. I said, well, it's not going to be xylophone, you know, and I said, I want to work on my traditional snare stuff that really opens swinging stuff, you know, like Gad does. He goes, OK, we'll work on that. And I said, I want to work on timpani, too. Yeah. So he would just kick my my tail all week and and give me. I'd have a couple lessons a week. And then I had another teacher that was just drum set. I had two different teachers. I had Dave Mancini who went there, who went on to play with Maynard Ferguson and Chuck Mangione and all these people. And Dave was just huge. 
Um, I would study with him some, and then I would study with Keith Copeland. And Keith Copeland um, was playing with the uh, Billy Taylor trio at the time. And Keith is a New York guy who played with Stevie Wonder in the 70s. And he's this guy who who is, a, is an excellent small small group drummer, but can play the funkiest, craziest, nastiest funk stuff and Latin stuff you've ever heard. And so Keith, they would all these teachers would give me all this material, and all I would do was just practice eight, ten hours a day every day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, this is during the summers at Eastman, and they would give me enough, enough material to work on all year until I came back the next year. And so I I would do that. I I would just work on everything they gave me, yeah. and they would kind of the next year I'd come in and go, well, let's see how you've progressed, you know. And, yeah, and it, yeah. but it was awesome because I was doing, I'd spend a few hours on timpani, a few hours on drum set, a few hours on rudimental snare stuff, and that's that's what I did at Eastman for you know a couple summers, and it was it, it changed my life because it in that as an eighteen nineteen year old, man twenty year old. I was thinking, okay, do I have, do, am I even in the ballpark? Can I compete? You know, do I have, am I going, I also realized that particular year, um, I realized what I didn't want to do. I I thought I wanted to play in orchestras and all that, but you got to wait till somebody dies to to a a job opens up or somebody retires. Like the year that I was there finishing up, the the guy from the L.A. Philharmonic retired. Mm-hmm. There's only one timpanist per orchestra. Yeah, and there must have been 200 people that were got their foot in the door to audition. And these were guys that just did timpani. Mm-hmm. They didn't do what I did. All this other stuff, drum set and rock and jazz. And all mm-hmm. these are guys that just did timpani. I'm like, you know what? I'm probably not gonna get my foot. <laughs> I'm probably not in their league at all. And I and I and I realized that really quick. So it's like I'm glad I had the knowledge. I'm glad I could do it. But yeah. I'm I'm gonna focus on being a studio guy and being a drum set guy. And so that was one of those realizations of I need to focus on that. And and that's the direction I need to go. I'm in school down Tuscaloosa, which is from Nashville, is roughly four hours, three and a half hours. And one of my one of my music school buddies, who I was in school with down in Alabama, transferred up to MTSU as a recording engineer major. And um, this guy's name is John Kelton, and he has gone on to to be wildly successful as as a, as a as an engineer here. He he's engineered every Alan Jackson record, wow. Zach Brown. All these people. And this guy is an absolute freak of nature. He's a brilliant musician. And oh, yeah, by the way, he's probably one of the best engineers in town. Yeah. Just just hate the guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, lucky me, I I was in music school with this guy down in Tuscaloosa. I'm still in college. He, he moved up here way before I did. And he, at the time, was engineering these karaoke tracks. They would, in Nashville, we would, we would record karaoke tracks to be used at all these different theme parks and and these little little independent uh little little kiosk and and malls where hey you can come in here and make a record you know well a lot of that was done here in nashville and it was every style so this is like 1985 because this is before i moved here and my buddy john would be an engineer and anyway you would go in on a saturday and you would record whatever was on the charts at that time. So it would be a Whitney Houston song, a Dire Straits song, an Anita wow. Baker song, a Motley Crue, um, a Pat Benatar, um, and then the hair, uh, the hair band stuff hadn't come in yet. Um, Aerosmith. Oh, yeah. It was just all over the map. Well, John recommended me. He's like, man, there's this drummer down in Alabama. Because there's plenty of guys in Nashville could have done it, but John just kind of had the inside scoop on it. And he recommended me I came up one Saturday. They'd pay me like $15 a song. And we'd do 12 or 15 songs every Saturday. Wow. And I'd come in. We'd record all day and all night. Yeah. And it had to be note for note because oh, wow. you, you're doing a record copy. Yeah. And, that's still, and it's still the way karaoke tracks are done. Right, right. You know? And that was my first studio experience in Nashville was doing these goofy karaoke tracks. But it got – but and so I did this account for a while. I would come up every, every few weeks mm-hmm. – 
and record all day Saturday, Sunday, drive back Sunday night, and make my classes Monday morning. I did, I did it many times, and, but that, and, and we did it over Studio 19, which is a, an, an iconic, legendary studio that they just tore down recently that just broke my heart. But that, um, that was my first experience in town, was doing those karaoke tracks. And then I was, so fast forward to, it's 1987, I'm getting out of school, I'm looking really hard at Atlanta, because I have some friends over there, and Atlanta's pretty pretty happening music scene. You know, Cameo was from there, and there's a lot of big R and B community there, obviously, and, yes. and all these people, wonderful players over there. So I was looking. I went over to Atlanta, and one of my best buddy horn player friends was over there, already over there working and do, doing stuff. And I went over there and played with them a few times. Got to play with with Kofi and O'Teal a couple of times. Sit in, <laughs> you know, who went on to be wildly successful um went to la a couple times and this is right at the time when all the hair bands were breaking out so all my la buddies are like i don't know man it i don't, I don't know if you're gonna break in the scene as a studio player here and, and everything else going on is all hair bands on the strip yeah. you know everybody yeah. doing poison and motley crew and right, right. torn jeans and big hair and all that i'm like i don't know man i don't want to i'm not really into doing that yeah. i looked at it really hard yeah. and so I was like, well, I already know just a handful of people here in town. The girl that I was dating in college who became my wife, we've now been together, well, we've been together 30 years. We've been married 26. That's awesome. We met when I was 19, yeah. very young. Wow. And um, she came here to teach fitness classes at Vanderbilt. And so we, um, I was like, well... I'm not, you know, everything was just lining up for me to come here. So I moved here with a Toyota with one suitcase and one set of drums. This came up in the Toyota and like, I'm here. And what got my, what, what got me up here was another thing was a, a, another friend. Um, th there were some wonderful people, Dave and Carolyn Martin, who are now big Western swing um, artists who are just wonderful. Carolyn Martin is just fantastic. They were looking for a drummer for a, a cover band to be a top 40 cover band to play around town and to go out in Texas and do the Texas bar circuit. Because at that time, man, it was just rocking. There was so many... Yeah. That bar circuit out there was very, very lucrative. Just around Dallas-Fort Worth, but you could go all over the state. But So we'd get in a van and a U-Haul and go over there and play. But anyway, they were looking for a drummer. I came to town drove straight to town to meet them, drove right to the Commodore Lounge, Vanderbilt Commodore Lounge at Holiday Inn. Yep. My buddy Martin Parker, who has recently passed away, who was is, who is my first big name, famous drummer I met in town. I met Martin that night. Martin was just filling in. He was just kind of getting them through some gigs because they needed a, a permanent drummer. Yeah. So Martin said, look, you come sit in, play a few songs. Let's just see how it goes. Little did I know that was my audition. Oh, okay. I sat in, played a few songs. They're like, "Oh, this guy, he's, he doesn't suck, you know. He, he's all right." Yeah. Well, they start. That's we were playing some, you know, Memphis R and B stuff. Then we started playing country. I'm like, well, "Man, I don't know those songs." He started calling out like current country stuff. I said, "Well, call some older stuff, like some standard, you know, Merle or Waylon or Willie, you know, something I might know." So, you know, we, we played some of that. I was like, you know, I got through that. I got the gig, and that was my first gig in town. My first big major artist gig was, within that year, Lee Greenwood was looking for a drummer, and he heard some demos I had played on, and he liked them. And then a lot of people kept recommending me. Now, if, if you flash back to that time, Greenwood was at his height. He was huge. I mean, he right. was doing arenas and doing big tours. And I um, got recommended, and I sent him a little tape, a little kind of greatest hits, a little tape of a bunch of demos I'd played on and stuff, and he heard that, and he invited me to audition. And this was like one of the big, big auditions of the time. Oh, was everybody, What's the hit? Proud to be an American? Yeah. The name yeah, of the Proud to be an American. God Bless the USA had already been right. out, been a monster hit, and he, already had, and he had other hits mm -hmm. as well. When I joined him, he had a top five record. Um, awesome. And then, um, but so the, the funny thing was, so here I was, age 23, 24. I'd been out of college less than a year. 
and I went from playing Texas bars and playing at the Commodore Lounge to to doing arenas and TV and doing all this big big stuff just like that. Nice. But yeah. it was and it was it was a great experience in that the funny thing was Greenwood had just gone through a divorce and he's like, "Boys, hang on, we're working." <laughs> <laughs> and so my first year I was gone. I looked back. I think I was gone 260 days that oh. first year. That was my first big gig. I did that for um, for six years, oh, okay. wow. for a long time. Yeah. And but I, I was one of these guys. I was smart enough in that the guys that I that I was influenced by and and and, and wanted to emulate were the in town guys that were doing sessions. Mm-hmm. And so I would whenever I was home, I would always go out and meet people and, and network and 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 meet other musicians and go sit in and and do all that stuff and and that was a thing where Martin, my dear friend Martin Parker, would he'd be playing at Nashville Palace or, or wherever, and I would just go out and hang out all night just to watch him play mm-hmm. and just mm-hmm. learn. That was a drum lesson. Yeah. Martin's the guy that taught me how to play train beat stuff. He goes, "Here's how you do it." And he'd show me 15 different ways to play Train Beach. And he'd go, and listen to Eddie, what Eddie Bears did on this. And listen to this guy. And go back and listen to Buddy Harmon on the, on the, on the Patsy Cline. And, and Martin was a wealth of information. Yeah. You know? And so I would go out to the Nashville Palace and watch Martin. And he would, this was on Sunday nights. And those guys were getting paid 50 bucks. Mm. And it was a great band. It was yeah. Bruce Bouton on steel guitar, wow. Matt, Matt McKenzie on, on bass, all these killer players. And Martin would get me up and let me sit in, get, get, give him a break. Yeah. And he, would, he was kind enough and generous enough to let me go sit in and play a few songs. Well, it turns out Martin started getting busier and busier. I became the regular guy because Martin got really busy with, um, with, with a couple other groups. And then Vince Gill, he start, Martin started working with Vince. And so that was the, the, one of the things of that started setting the groundwork and me doing all these little goofy low-budget demos. And I would go to songwriters' houses and do all these demos on my off time whenever I was home with Greenwood. So it, as Greenwood's scaling back his road dates, I'm getting busier and busier and busier in town. Yeah. And I eventually just made the leap and said, you know, Lee, this has been great. It's been awesome. And, he's t- and he, was, he was so understanding. He, he's like, man, I get it. You want to be a session guy, say, in town? And so I made the leap and um, left his left his group and then um, was just in town guy and was doing and this is in the '90s so if you remember the era there was this is when you know the record business was booming and then Garf came out and it was just yeah. crazy and, and then you know Sony had a hundred writers and EMI had eighty writers and I was doing demos like crazy and, and then starting to play on records I played on a Greenwood album you know that James Stroud produced which was that's pretty nerve wracking having a a session drummer be your producer of the first major record you ever played on and oh guess who's producing you know yeah, that yeah. wasn't nerve wracking at all you know and, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and, but Stroud was awesome you know he was he was great in the studio and um, and uh, but uh, I was just playing on everything uh, demo wise I, I had all these accounts and that started leading to more and more stuff and one of the most interesting things I did and which probably nobody knows was um, there was a there was a, a record that Quincy Jones executive produced called uh, Handel's Messiah, a soulful celebration, and it was where all these different major artists each played a a piece from Handel's Messiah. Mm-hmm. So like Take Six did a, a version of their you know jazz vocal mm-hmm. of a piece from the Messiah, and Stevie Wonder did did a track, and oh, and nice. all these multiple artists. Well, Al Jarreau did this burning big band track. Well, I got the call to play this up tempo, ding, 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 scorching big band track. Wow. Because the producer, uh, Mervyn Warren, who was a founding member of Take Six, Mervyn and, Mervyn and Cedric were in music school with me. Oh, they were in Take yeah. Six. Take Six was heavily involved with Quincy and with this album. Yeah. They called Mervyn, called me out of the blue and said, and didn't even tell me who it was. Yeah. He said, we're, all I can tell you is it's for Quincy Jones. It's a big band track. I know you can play big band because I had worked with him yeah. before. He goes, I know you can do big band. I can't tell you who's singing on it, yeah. but I need you to be here. Wow. I canceled everything. I, I, he wouldn't even tell me. And we recorded it here in Nashville, and it was an Al Jarreau track. 
When was the last it, time you had played big band at that point? Oh, at that point, well, this is '92. So, okay. and I was even still, I was still with Greenwood. I happened to be in town. I was on a, was, he called me like on a Sunday night and said, "Are you free, uh, like on a Monday or, or Tuesday?" Yeah. I said, "Well, I can be. What, yeah. what's up?" And he goes, "I can't tell you, but you got to be here." <laughs> Right. <laughs> like okay, and uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I still, I still kept my chops up. I still listen to Count Basie and, and everything, and, and still practice that stuff. And just okay. at the time, I would play and, and pick up bands for fun. I'd go play with the Nashville. I would go sit in sometimes with big band jam mm-hmm. nights, you know, and mm-hmm. okay. um, so I could still play it, you know. And s- s- so that was one of the oddball things that that. There, at that time, there was only a few people that knew I could play that stuff, you yeah. know. And so he, he said, you, you need to be on this. I said, okay, you know. And yeah. anyway, I show up and and went and did it, and it, it it's on the album. They kept my count off. That's my vocal on there going, one, two, one, two, three, four, boom, ba, ba, ba. You know? <laughs> he like, he like, he like, yeah. I said, well, you know, I get vocal skill for that. You know that, right? <laughs> and, uh, they, we did three takes. They kept the first take. So the first take is, is on the album. Yeah. And um, that's one of those oddball things that people to this day go, what, 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 there's more than country going on in Nashville? I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. There is all sorts of stuff going and on in Nashville. Even more so now, but I mean, you're talking about the 90s when, when country was huge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you know, another, another thing uh, I've been lucky enough to do um, was um, Sir Cliff Richard, who, who had some hits in the 80s here. Um, like you know, Devil Woman and and Suddenly was a big duet with Olivia Newton John. But over in Europe, especially the UK, you know, he's British. You know, he's the closest living thing to Elvis. I mean, he he had hits as a teen idol before the Beatles. His first hits were in fifty seven, fifty eight. Oh wow! So he was the British answer to Elvis. Yeah. This is yeah. way before Tom Jones or Engelbert or anybody like that. I mean, okay. Cliff Richard was it. Cliff Richard was the guy that the Beatles were doing covers of Cliff. You know. Oh wow! So. Um, I've, I've played on three Cliff Richard albums now, oh, that's and awesome. he loves to come over here and record with American musicians in Nashville. The first one I did with him like 13 years ago or so, yeah. and um, and so he, he's the sweetest, nicest guy, and he's one of those legendary voices, you know. But so that's another thing. He comes in and does rock. And I mean, like early rock and roll. He, like he, he, well, I mean, he'll do his stuff, but he he likes to do like Chuck Berry and Little Richard and and mm-hmm. and early Elvis and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And the guy's a walking; he's a music encyclopedia. Mm-hmm. Like he has mm-hmm. the firsthand stories, but he also knows the genre really well. Right, right. And so we did an album recently where, um, where the, my bandmate Steve Mandel. Got to produce. He's produced Cliff now several times. He asked Peter Frampton to come in and play a solo. And Peter, Peter came in, and we got to meet him and record with him, which is a whole other you know incredible story. But Peter was like, "No, this is on my bucket list." He goes, "I've never met Cliff, and mm-hmm. Cliff was like one of the idols I listened to when I was a teenager, yeah. you know." And 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 Peter was all, you know. It, it, just honored to be there and so humble and like, you know, I'd finally get to meet Cliff and play with Cliff. Peter Peter came out and hung out all day in the studio and was yeah. just watching us cut and just hanging out and we got to talk and I was like, Peter, I just saw you play the Ryman, you know, with Steve Cropper last year and boy, that was a great tour and everything, you know. Yeah, yeah, and, right. and and he's like, he didn't even want to talk about him. He wanted to talk about Cliff yeah. and, and the early Beatles stuff and, and how oh. he was telling us at a British teenager what a big deal cliff was in the 60s early and mid 60s you know i said well i've done my you know i said i knew and and peter was like no i mean he was you know everybody you know cliff was our elvis you know yeah yeah. and uh, and he still is you know he he's he's recorded over 100 albums he still sells out royal albert he can go play royal albert for a week and sell out every night play for the song it's not about you. It's not about giving a drum clinic and overplaying and doing all this crazy stuff. That's what I tell people, and that's what I try to bring in when I'm doing sessions. 
I try to give the writer and the artist what I think they have in mind. And some artists, some artists are really great about conveying exactly, that's how Richard is. Richard is, knows exactly what he wants. He can play drums. He can tell you ex- down to the drum fill. Do this instead of that. Play this rhythm. He, he, he's so in tune to, to how to tell musicians. He's a good director. Okay. Other artists come in with an acoustic guitar. That's how Dolly is. Dolly comes in. She has an acoustic. She sits like this, and she'll just play you the song. Yeah. acoustically or she'll play your work tape and it's just an acoustic vocal and that's it yeah right and it's up to your interpretation sure to figure it out what she's wanting and, and to maybe give her some different options you know and so that's as a session guy i try to bring that to the table and, and give them some options and and a lot of times i'll do some things instinctively instinctively that i think oh this is exactly what they want and the producer or whomever might go, no, 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 do something else. And I'm thinking, what? How can this not be it? How, th- <laughs> this is what, this is the go-to groove for that. You know? Yeah. Are you, yeah. you know? And I'm thinking, oh my god. And then they they'll think of something that I didn't think of, or, or they'll sometimes you, right. your best ideas from non-drummers. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Be it the songwriter had something in mind or the producer, yeah. and there'll be a thing like, well. Instead of doing a, a breakdown thing on the bridge, maybe do a maybe do a Ringo eighth note tom thing on, on the eighth note floor tom thing on the bridge with your right hand, and just take the snare out and, and do a hi hat, hat on the mm-hmm. two and four or a tambourine or 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 um, there could be this rock and slam and guitar solo, and and I'm thinking. Big quarter note cymbal bell, just tanging the hump, you know, slamming it home, and, and the producer might go, "No, I'm hearing more of a closed hat, you know, not so aggressive thing." Right. I'm like, "I'm like, what are you saying?" You know, I'll go, you know right. keep your mouth shut. Remember, exactly. remember your role. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, and sometimes they're yeah. conveying these ideas, and they're not using the proper, you know, they're not using the terminology that a oh. musician or a, a drummer would use. Or oh, right. Like that. so that's the most difficult. You have to reinterpret. It's totally good. That, and, that's, and you can't yeah. correct them. You can't, no, you know, no. hey, will you play a roll around? Like, what do you mean? You like a buzz roll? No, no. They, you know, like that means yeah. fill sometimes. Right. You play right. That? Play, play that rim shot. And you play a rim shot. They're like, no. That what they meant was side stick. Exactly. And you're playing a rim shot, just taking their head off. They're like, right. no, right. Right. stop. Right. Hey, well, yeah. you said rim shot. Well, no, no, I meant that other thing. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Term, that, terminology, they, they're that clueless. That guy over there or this, yeah. Yeah, tang the hump, right. which they mean cymbal bell. <laughs> you know. Okay. That's good. I, 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 oh, I got one great story. Yeah. A very well-known producer who's produced a lot of big hit records. This is, I don't know, 15 years ago. He, um, I'm, we're doing a session it was a master and he and this is a big country rock artist and um we did a we did a couple passes and he's like i just i want more energy i want you to ramp up this verse and and wrap it up into the chorus and, and 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 give it you know just just give me a little more energy a little more stuff meaning he wanted a bigger longer busier fill so instead of a one bar fill I did a two bar, pretty busy, a lot of stuff, mm-hmm. and um, we do it, and we get into the chorus. He stops, you know, hear the talk back. He's like, "Well, Chuck, um, man, that was great. That was fantastic. That that was one of the most creative drum fills I've heard. That's that really incredible. But can you play it more ignorant next time?" <laughs> <laughs> meaning, meaning, and of course, everybody just falls out, and I just kind of you know went from a smile to just kind of put my head down. Like, hey, <laughs> and what he meant was play a shorter feel with less notes, and and just yeah. instead of going instead of doing this crazy Vinny stuff, just yeah. give me a two, three, gun, 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 you know, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he, play more ignorant. <laughs> Right, right. I mean, but everybody knew exactly what he meant. Sure, you sure. know, well, uh, Louis Belson has a story about a producer, an executive producer that came in on the session when they were in the middle of it. And he said, uh, "Sounds great, guys. Um, could you play it an octave faster?" <laughs> an octave faster, yeah. and he goes, "No problem. You got it." Yeah, 
Exactly. And they did. Exactly. They did. Uh, yeah, I've had to, in my, and I learned, you know, I started here very young. And when, I, and when I started getting more and more demo accounts, working directly with the songwriters, who were some great veteran songwriters, and these are guys in their 50s and 60s, very successful Hall of Fame guys. Mm-hmm. Some of them really knew musical terms very well. Yeah. Some did not have a clue. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. And that's where I learned the most in trying to figure out what they were trying to convey to me musically and learn to keep my mouth shut. Don't correct people over the mic. Right. Don't go, oh, you meant he'd, he'd play, you know, play that, uh, give me a diamond there, play a diamond and, and do that boom chicka thing. And meaning, Oh, you mean play a whole note and the yeah. bass player go, yeah, man, a whole note. I mean, you know, diamond means a whole note, you know, and and boom chicka thing. I mean, like in, in Johnny Cash train beat. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that Johnny Cash, you know, right, right. And and it, 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 being a younger guy way back when, I would just have to to um, you know be. Um, keep your mouth shut but but um be giving and and let them try to work through it and figure it out you know right. don't don't show people up or don't don't correct people you know yeah, and, with people. musical terms you know being mr music school exactly. guy you experience. know don't be that don't be that guy i joined the band alabama a few oh years ago gosh. when they when they reunited that was another about five years ago, th- right? Right, right, right. That was another situation where I had to, where reading music and knowing how to chart really well paid off, paid off in, in spades. In that, there's a group with forty three number one songs. Yeah, I had to know those forty something number one songs plus the other top five songs they had. You know, yeah. so I needed to know fifty or sixty songs in a short amount of time. And that's where that really paid off in that wow. knowing how to chart and, and write out rhythms mm-hmm. and really learn everything note for note and, and then learn the live versions the way that they would do them. And um, when I first got the gig years ago, that was that really came in handy because yeah, yeah. Um, not that we played 44 songs in a show, we could, but you never knew which songs we would call out right. because they there's, there's kind of a core... You know, maybe ten or fifteen songs we always do because just yes, you gotta do them. Got but it. then, but then the lead singer Randy Owen has written a lot of the songs, and people it's like Springsteen concert. People will hold up poster boards with song titles and right. forget the set list. We we have a set list, but that's just more of a serving suggestion. That's not yes, a exactly <laughs> yeah right right. It's not the script. Yeah. And so he will literally just go into any random song at any time, and you gotta know it. You know, and if you don't know it, I've got a, a, a chart book hidden down below my hi hat, and it's a three ring binder. It's quicker than an iPad. I know it's hard to believe, but it's a three ring binder with sixty or seventy charts. And not that I need every one of them, but there's some like an album cut or maybe an early hit that I can't remember. So I've got this chart book mm-hmm. down there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And by the way, nothing is on tracks, and not not one thing in that show is ever on tracks at oh, any wow. time. Cool. And if he starts going to some random song, I'll just start panicking, you know, quickly flipping through that three ring binder. It's all in alphabetical order. Yeah. Thank yeah, God. Yeah. And that's how we do it. Yeah. Me and the music director have books. And then of course the rest of the band is, is the, is the, uh, the, the trio, the, the guys, and, the partners. And, and you guys don't play that often. It seems over the last five years. Yeah. We, well, we'll do maybe 30 dates a year, maybe okay. 25 to 30, which is enough. And that keeps you up and in shape and, 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 okay. and like, you know, but still, it's not, it's not, you're, you're not doing no, it's 150 shows a year where no. eventually you can start kind of getting rid of it. We, we do no, usually two dates and I, I fly out maybe on a Friday and come back Sunday. So it's real. The schedule's perfect. Yeah. And, and I, it doesn't really interfere with too much. I still do dates for the Nashville TV show, and Six Wire does dates, and I, I sub some dates with Felix Cavallari still. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so Alabama doesn't quite. Um, it's huge though, man. It, it's, it's the schedule's just perfect. I just yeah. kind of make it all work, and but it um. Or, 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 or and we we bust too. And if it's a regional um, routing date where everything's together, we'll just bus out and mm-hmm. play and bus right back. So. Yeah. But, man, listen, I really appreciate. It talking sit down
Oh, thank thank you. Busy schedule. This is great. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed it. And you make you make great coffee too. I like that. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So there's my interview with Chuck Tilly. Uh, It was great. Uh, Just all that information about what it's like to work with a TV producer and how to lead the band, how to count them in quickly, and just having an understanding of the way TV is produced. And uh, jumping from one opportunity to another, uh, just showing that professionalism, it's been great uh, to just hear those stories from him. That was, that was really cool. I want to thank Mike Jackson for uh, some extra work that we put in this weekend. We spent some time at the rehearsals for the Nashville Drummer Jam filming, and uh, we also did some stuff at the show, uh, which was great, and uh, he put in some extra time with me with that. And um, so, again, thanks to him and getting stuff up online and, uh, and all that good stuff. So that was really helpful, and I appreciate him. Just to put a final word uh, on the Nashville Drummer Jam, uh, the Nashville Drummer Jam 7 happened this Monday. It was the tribute to Alex Van Halen. Uh, so I guess the last thing that I want to say about it is that um, it was a complete success. It was awesome. Uh, the club, the exit in, was at capacity. Um, every player brought it. It was a, just a fun, great thing. John Douglas, the drum tech and designer of Alex's kit, flew in from Texas to be there to help us set up Alex's drum set that Alex sent from California. And that was amazing, and there's pictures floating around everywhere on that kit, and, and all the players got to use that kit. It was just, it was amazing. And the charity that benefited from this was Open Table Nashville, which is a local organization. Fortunately, it's an organization that my wife is involved with. It's the organization that helps find housing for homeless people and just uh, creates opportunity for those who are experiencing poverty. And Alex Van Halen and his management company came through with flying colors. I cannot tell you how grateful we are, how the community here is grateful for his generosity and the management's generosity. It, it, it's just, it's unbelievable and unexpected, but um, again, we're just so grateful and, and honored to be a part of what has happened. So we're all still buzzing from, from that. Uh, it, it, and I usually do a, a shout out to somebody that maybe makes a comment here or there um, about our podcast. But uh, I want to take this time to mention uh, a local drummer, Brian Clune, who was at the Drummer Jam. He was not one of the drummers that participated, but he's one of the drummers. He's one of the individuals that saw the information about Open Table. And now he's looking to do some volunteer work with the organization. So I want to do a shout out to Brian. Uh, That is a really cool thing, and it's nice that that connection was made. That just speaks volumes about Brian, and that's just a really cool thing. Thanks, Brian. Again, thank you everyone for listening, and I hope to see you around. Bye-bye.